Okay, today we're going to try to answer the big question. Is China a threat to the United States? Trust me, no matter if you are pro-China or pro-US, the way I answer this question is going to surprise a lot of you. Okay, And for majority of my audience, it will be thought-provoking, I'll say. Let's dive in. Many people watched the all-in conference discussion between Professor John Mearsheimer and Professor Jeffrey Sachs last week. I didn't even know there was a think tank panel discussion, and it was here in Los Angeles, where I am living. So if I knew ahead of time, I would have been there. Now, many geopolitical analysts in China was very excited about the show as well. Some even watched the show multiple times to make sure to digest every drop of details. One of the biggest questions raised during the exchange was whether China is a threat to the US or not. Now, for my audience who haven't watched it, you're welcome to do so, but I have my own separate take on this. This is actually not an easy question to answer. Not unless I insert some precondition first. In order for my audience to better digest my answer to the question, it is vital that I slip in some additional information to prepare my audience for my answer. Okay, I used to travel the world frequently, especially before COVID. When I arrived back in my home in Shanghai and get onto a taxi, the taxi driver loved to ask me similar questions such as, um, how is Europe or US? Are they better than here in China? is because they have democracy and so on. Here in the United States or in Europe, a decade ago that is, people are not very interested in asking about China. They just don't care. However, recent years, regular people here in the West also started to behave like the taxi drivers in Shanghai. They become very nosy and want to know more about China. And often the question of whether China is a threat to the US or to Europe comes up often, directly or indirectly. Now, I consider myself to be a deep thinker. And I like to have thoughtful exchange with people, sometimes stranger on geopolitical issues and on philosophical questions. However, from my experience, whether it is in China or in Europe or in US, majority of the people are not ready for this kind of exchange because most people are not comfortable in stepping out of their own ideological comfort zone. And when I start to say things that are more controversial, they either got lost in the conversation or they feel uncomfortable and start shying away or they never had the interest to go that deep to begin with. So for me, I often get disappointed because as I get warm up with my thoughts, that person's interests start to cool down and die off. So over the years, I developed a technique, okay? I will give them a short answer, but I set some hints and traps in it as bait. If the person really wants to dig deeper, and take the bait, then I will open myself up for more conversation. But if the person is satisfied with my answer and not wanting to ask follow up questions, that means that the person is not interested to know more. So I won't waste my breath at the end getting all hyped up. So today I'm going to use that exact same approach to test my audience. Okay. Here we go. So on to the question. Is China a threat to the United States? To answer that question, it really depends on who is asking that question. Okay. It is not about whether that person is American or not. It is about the person's grand understanding of geopolitics of the world that we're living in. Okay, so the first thing you should do is to ask a question back at them. The question is this. Well, 
it depends. Do you see the United States of America as a normal sovereign country, just like other sovereign countries around the world? Or do you see the United States as a global empire? Let me make it clear where this is going, okay? If somebody asks me that question, that's like asking me if the sun rises from the east or from the west. <laughs> to me, the answer is with 100% certainty that the United States of America as of today is a global hegemonic colonial empire. Remember, the word colonial is very important. Not just to this statement, but to literally my entire channel, okay? And it's extremely aggressive in projecting its financial monetary power, its military power, and also ideological power around the world. But majority of the people, especially in the collective West, uh, do not see it that way. Even many active audience of my channel have doubts about that. So let's not force that reality onto them yet. So if a person answered the question of mine, saying that, well, US is just a normal sovereign country and occasionally <laughs> helping other countries to become more democratic, okay, and over enthusiastic sometimes. To me, that's like pointing at a hyena and say, that's a baby giraffe, which is ridiculous. But to convince a person to see the United States as what it is, it's very time consuming and it will definitely bump into many ideological barriers. And that's not even the question here. The question is whether China is a threat to the United States, right? So you should go along with the person's existing mindset, go along with the flow. So if a person considers the United States as a normal country, more or less, then the answer is no. China is not a threat to the United States. I mean, think about it this way, okay? There are currently 193 United Nations recognized states in this world. And subtracting China, there's 192 states. If China is a threat to the United States, a country that is separated by 7,000 miles of ocean, 12,000 kilometers of water, the US also has the largest nuclear arsenal one of the largest nuclear arsenal in the world with all the conventional weapons. If China is a threat to the United States, then China is a much bigger threat to any other countries on this planet. Since majority of the countries do not have nuclear weapons or any armies that is as powerful as the United States has. So if on a scale of zero to 10, the threat level of China to US is, let's say, a seven, okay? Then what's the threat level of China to, let's say, Vietnam? <laughs> it would be like something like 30 or 50 or 100. It would be way off the chart, basically, right? Same thing if you add, for example, democracy into the statement. Is China a threat to democracy? You can ask the Indians, okay? The, the biggest democracy on this planet. Is China a threat to India? Many Indians will say yes. But if you ask an Indian, is China a threat to India's democracy? <laughs> Who's going to say yes to that? Hell no, right? In fact, to many Chinese philosophers, Indian democracy is one of the biggest obstacles that prevents India from catching up to China. But that's another topic, not for today. I mean, majority of the countries in the global south are in some form of democracy and how many of them think that china is a threat to their democracy zero i mean even if you ask philippines the tension of south china sea i think many filipinos see china as a threat to their national security yes but i highly doubt any filipinos see china as a threat to their democracy so that's basically a joke. So if you can conjure up all the talking points from Professor Jeffy Sachs, come on guys, <laughs> China is not a threat. China is the one who made all of us rich, right? 
In fact, Professor Jeffrey Sachs said the U.S. is the biggest threat to democracy, which is very true, by the way. I use that line in the comments sections a lot. <laughs> However, like I said, that entire conversation or explanation is rather meaningless because for my more advanced group of audience and for people who seek truth and accept reality of the world we live in and truly understand the United States to a certain degree, those who see the hyena as a hyena, not a baby giraffe, people who accept the reality that the United States is a global empire ran by a group of transnational global capitalists whose power and interest is anchored to the US dollar and the US financial system, then the answer to the question is yes, China is the biggest threat to the United States since the World War II. Or you can be more accurate with the wording. China is the biggest threat to the United States unipolar global hegemonic empire. And we can debate exactly when the United States turned into such a global empire. It would take a lot of effort to go into the detail of explaining why China is the biggest threat to the US empire. But for short condensed explanation is that as long as China exists, remain as its current form and continue to grow and engage and trade with the rest of the world, it will slowly but surely dilute the US empire's grabs on the planet. The US style empire is, what's the word? Mutually exclusive in that sense, okay? You just cannot have a US global empire on one side and have a China who's trying to grow within that empire because it will ultimately weaken, damage, and eventually destroy the US global empire. That scenario of coexisting does not exist. So in principle, either the US has to adjust its course and retreat back to something like a regional hegemon, or that China has to stop growing and let the US dictate its financial, monetary, and industrial policy to let the US position China in a way to favor the United States, just like US tried and successfully positioned Japan and Germany in favor of the United States. And even that, I felt like it is still a potential threat in the future uh, to the US global empire. So it will be best for the United States if it can break apart China into like an European Union or Middle East style divide and conquer region or Africa or Latin America, smaller independent states that will be much less threatening to the United States in the long run. Now, let me say something to see if my audience understand and agree with me, okay? The world can have two Soviet Union coexist peacefully with each other. The world can have two China coexist peacefully together. But the world cannot have two United States, today's United States that is, coexist peacefully together. No. So it would be horrifying and apocalyptic almost if today's China tries to become the United States, which from all my knowledge and understanding, it's not going down that path. But if China insists on becoming the United States or replacing the United States, or some of my audience or other people say that, you know, more naive uh, audience will say that, well, China should try to become like the United States. That will be terrifying, you know, having China try to run the world like the United States is currently doing. I mean, just imagine. US has a population of 350 million, roughly. China is at 1.4 billion, so roughly four times the population of the United States. I mean, look at Professor Chen here, his t shirt, okay? Do what Americans do, don't do what Americans say. Now, imagine 
China's foreign policy is run by the Chinese military industrial complex <laughs> or the Chinese financial oligarchy class, whatever you want to call it, four times the size of the United States. We'll have four times more troops deployment to the entire world, okay? Four times the amount of military base around the world. We have four Dick Cheney, we have four Mike Pompeo, we have four Victoria Luna, you know? It's like arguing with a kid on the playground, you know? Whatever you say times four, imagine that, okay? Is that something everyone is looking forward to? <laughs> no. I mean, there's a good chance that if China is really aiming towards that goal, and is in the process of doing so, we might never get to the Chinese unipolar hegemonic world because I don't think the planet Earth can survive the process of such an arrangement, okay? So going back to the discussion, the panel between Professor Jeffy Sachs and Professor John Mearsheimer, to answer the question again, is China a threat to the United States? The answer is a simple, definite yes. Because the US currently is a global hegemonic empire, whether we like it or not, we must accept that the hyena is a hyena, not a baby giraffe. And today's China is the biggest threat to that US empire. In fact, I will go as far as to say that as long as China continue to grow, it will back the United States empire, the United States global empire, into a corner. And that's how severe the problem is, okay? I know some of my faithful audience uh, who might disagree with me on this matter. Let me try to read your mind, okay? The potential confusion you have towards what I just said is that in your mind, you already predetermined that the United States shouldn't run a global empire, that it should behave itself like a normal country. So your logic is US should not continue to be a global empire and should behave like a normal sovereign country. And as a normal sovereign country, China is not a threat to the United States. That I can agree, yes. So again, going back to the John Jeffy discussion, is China a threat to the US? Yes, definitely yes, because US is already a global empire and none of the people on stage that day or in the audience has any say on whether US should stop running the global empire. A more intelligent set of questions, a more meaningful set of questions that is on stage that day is whether U.S. should continue to run such a global empire or not. If U.S. continue down this global empire path, which by all indication at the moment, it is heading down that path for sure, what strategy it should apply? And how feasible, how sustainable can U.S. maintain this global empire? That is actually a good question. So other questions like, um, meaningful question that is, how to contain China or how to eventually collapse China? What strategy to use? What is the chance of success? What is the cost to the United States? What is the cost to the rest of the world, which the United States usually don't care that much? How many proxies you have to throw at China? Right? How many Chinese neighbors you have to color revolution and turn them into Ukraine and throw at them in order to, you know, contain China and eventually destroy China? That is a good question, actually. Will the rest of the world be willing to go along with the strategy in containing and destroying China? The answer is no, of course. But if not, what will you, the United States, do to get them to go along with you? And then you also have to measure the cost and the risk. I mean, you have to give the US credit where credit is due. US is the best country in conducting color revolution and regime change. It is literally better at that than all the rest of the countries in the world combined, I would say. 
However, destabilizing and regime changing a country is one thing. Can you maintain your puppet regime in power for long duration and cut off the country's trade relationship with China and weaken China's economy and influence over time? Can you keep such regime in power for a long time? Remember, China is the biggest trade partner with over 100 countries in the world. And China is offering real products, which improve the standard of living of those countries, not offering currency or financial Ponzi scheme assets, right? Which drive inequality in that case. Many countries under the influence of the US, like Argentina or Italy, who try to cut off certain ties with China have to eventually run back to China for help. So if US wants certain countries to cut off economic ties with China in the long run, it needs to offer alternative. If not, those countries will have to go back to China very soon. And finally, another good question can be, for example, um, if US decide it shouldn't be a global empire any longer, or at least at the moment, it is not fit to continue this global empire. It's not feasible. How can US retreat itself to a regional status without going to collapse? It's a very difficult task to do. Most empire collapse in a catastrophic way because its entire political economic system relies on the existing of that empire. These are the more meaningful questions to me to address on stage, but it is rather pointless because the on stage holds that day and the majority of the off stage audience that they probably have a very now, when, now, when should the win here? The too simple. Uh, sometimes naive. <laughs> Don't know me, huh? <laughs> sit down, sit down. <laughs> Shallow understanding of the situation we're in. So those meaningful questions will just confuse most of the audience. Now, let me draw a conclusion here to my beloved Professor John Mearsheimer and Professor Jeffrey Sachs, which I respect a lot. Let's start with uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs first. Jeffrey Sachs knows what the United States is, okay? Not because he watched my YouTube channel or read John Mearsheimer's book. He knew by his own experience, running around the world, seeing US power projection in action, what it has done to many of the global South countries around the planet. But he's an American and he loves his countries. Nothing wrong with that. So if you watch his video and broadcast and his speech, he constantly tried to reveal to his audience what US foreign policy truly is and how US shouldn't run this global empire. He loves United States as a country and his people not the global empire side of the country, okay? So when he says China is not a threat to the United States, the bigger message he tries to send out is that U.S. should stop running this cruel hegemonic empire, global empire, and should empower the United Nations to enforce world order or something along that line. I have watched many videos from Professor Jeffrey Sachs, and I have heard political economists in China who I respect a lot, bringing up Professor Jeffrey Sachs' name in their discussion. Now, listen to this, okay? Professor Jeffrey Sachs knows a lot more than Professor John Mearsheimer in terms of what is exactly happening on the ground. And he's not letting out all the things he knows. So for people who see still kind of denied whether US is just a regular state or empire, maybe you should volunteer to, you know, work for Professor Jeffrey Sachs and, you know, go along to different countries and see what's going on around the world. And if you come back, can you really, you know, sit down with me and tell me 
in my face that the U.S. is just a normal country and not an empire. I guarantee you, you, you can't. Now, I don't think Professor Jeffrey Sachs is letting out all the things he know because, well, this is probably due to national security reasons. He knows something that will in conflict of the interests of uh, the United States. And he's also trying to protect his uh, own source. That's, that's also one of the reason. And again, he's a patriotic American. It's normal for him to always sugarcoat his narrative a bit. So his normal, less informed audience will not get too offended or too confused by what he's trying to say. You know how I feel when I watch his video? Um, imagine the reality consists of you know, five separate layers, okay? And when he reaches maybe the middle sector, the middle layer, either the host of the show will stop him because he's starting to say something very provocative and inappropriate for mass audience, or the show is running out of time and he has to stop and conclude. And in the next show, he has to start all over again <laughs> from the initial layer. So at the end, to me, he never reached enough depth to glue his entire narrative together. Or maybe as an American, he's just too ashamed to paint the whole picture. That's also possible as well. So if you watch his live conference, it almost felt like every time he would enter the stage of um, PTSD. <laughs> so if you watch his live conference and talk shows and broadcasts, uh, especially sometimes in front of mass amount of audience, it almost felt like every time he would enter the stage of uh, PTSD, when he knows so much about the facts, but always face the same naive and uninformed and disinformed audience and host. Wait, 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 Jeffrey, Jeffrey. Shouldn't we be fighting dictators and help liberate the world from crazy authoritarian regimes and leaders, dictators like Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping? You know, <laughs> since Kim Jong-un came to power, uh, how many people did Kim kill outside of his own country? And how many people, let's say China or Xi Jinping, killed? in the disputed South China Sea over the decades with the Filipinos, for example. Can anyone tell me? Zero over the decades. You know, on average, Americans kill more Iraqi and Syrian per day than China and North Korea kill outside of their own border over the recent decades combined. I would say almost that way. So let me show you what Jeffrey said looks like on stage. Why we're lacking it, because in 1992, the leaders in my country, many of my colleagues at Harvard and elsewhere said, we are now the unchallenged colossus of the world. We can do what we want. Jeffrey, and, and just to say, uh, and, and wait, just look, look, let me, because he asked, I'm going to finish but, the, I'm going to finish the answer. No, no, and, and then, then I, I will give the floor to you. Time. Sorry. So, okay. No, no. Just to keep, say, keep, if oh, you say who recently. made most of the wars of recent years, first NATO bombed Serbia in 1999, UN, no way. The invasion of Iraq under complete lies, not misunderstanding, but lies. The CIA operation to overthrow Assad in, nine, in 2009. I think you've the NATO, the question, the NATO Jeff, mission to overthrow sake. Gaddafi. And then we say, how can anyone launch a war? Well, four of the last five came from the United States side. And NATO enlargement did as well. We need some balance and prudence. That's my point. You've answered the question. Now, on to Professor John Mearsheimer. I watched tons of John's video. It's literally everywhere. <laughs> Let me condense his thoughts into a nutshell, okay? It's rather simple. Offensive realists, okay, here we go. John Mearsheimer, number one, US is a global hegemon. 
I agree. Yeah. Whether John likes it or whether I like it or whether you, my audience, like it, it doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant. Okay. If I say US is an imperial, global, hegemonic, colonial empire, I bet John Mearsheimer will agree with me as well. At least off stage. I'm not sure if he will agree something like that on stage. I have a feeling that John Mearsheimer might not understand the mechanics or the details of how the US global empire operates. At least not as well as someone like Professor Michael Hassan. But he will still agree with me of what United States truly is, okay? Now, second point. China is the biggest threat to the US hegemonic empire, much bigger than Russia and, let's say, Iran. I totally agree. Again, yes. It is best for US to redirect its attention to Asia in containing China for the sake of continuation of US dominance over the world to continue this global empire. That I would say yes and no. If there's no mess in Middle East and Ukraine, then definitely yes. But now with all those two battlefields, US need to you know, wrap up the situation in a way that will minimize the damage to United States reputation and also minimize its damage to United States power projection before moving on to China. So US cannot just abandon those places in a rush. That will do more harm than good to the United States, that is. So I agree with John Mearsheimer's post-conflict prediction. <laughs> Conventional wisdom in the West, which says we were not. We were working to bring Ukraine into NATO. So but, what options are available in this post-conflict period or, or mid-conflict period? W what are the realistic options now? There are no think? realistic options. We're screwed. I mean, what does that mean practically, though, we're screwed? It means you believe the conflict is now destined to escalate or just destined to grind on? Well, both. Yes, US is a bit screwed. What is the metaphor here? The, the toothpaste is already out of the tube. <laughs> yeah, that's how you say it in English, right? So what's the realistic scenario in Ukraine right now? NATO, US either have to accept humiliation or provoke Russia to use nuclear weapon. <laughs> it's choosing between a rock and a hard place, to be honest, so it's difficult. Okay, that's John Mearsheimer's surface layer. If you go below the surface, here's what John Mearsheimer is, okay? The tragedy of great power politics. How great power always feels insecure about itself and need to obtain more power. That's the first thing. Mm. I partially agree with that, okay? The second point, China, India, Russia all want to become US one day. It is an undeniable fact, <laughs> which I disagree, but I don't blame him because, because judging from the centuries of Western domination over the world, okay, the Western world order, which has been to this very moment, a colonial order. And it is best to be the power that colonize others than, let's say, let other people colonize you. So there's this pre-programmed pre thought that I know how shitty US is treating some countries in the global south, yes. And it is best that we don't put ourselves in a position in which another country get to treat us that way, okay? So, Americans, do you want to experience the century of humiliation? If not, you better not let China rise even further. <laughs> I guess that's a value argument in, in that wicked way. <laughs> but hey, you, you can't argue with that. So, according to John, okay, statistically speaking, whatever that comes after the US empire, will be as brutal and as reckless, if not more, than the US empire itself. 
So Americans should try its best to preserve the current world order. And of course, he's a patriot, so that makes sense too. And of course, at last, China is by far the biggest threat to the US empire and needs to be contained, which from the point of view of US empire, I agree with him completely. So you can't really argue with John Mearsheimer regarding the question, is China a threat to the United States? Because in his heart, the world will always be run by a hegemonic power like the United States. So it's better to be me than you, because John believes other powers aim to replace the United States and not really aim to change the system. And you can't discredit him because we human being, ever since European colonial power integrating the entire world, have proven there's no other alternative. He's a realist. <laughs> so realists do not believe in alternative that has never happened. And whatever multipolar world China, Russia is conjuring up, it's likely to be bad for the United States. So it's better to maintain this current unipolar world. That's John Mearsheimer in the nutshell. So to summarize all that into one statement, okay? As long as US insists on maintaining its posture as a global empire, and as long as China stays united as one country and continue to seek development, the clash between the two countries is rather unavoidable, unfortunately. And I'll see you guys in the next video.